A special and warm welcome everyone to, to our seminar today, um, proudly presented to you by the Centre of Research Excellence in Aphasia Recovery and Rehabilitation and the Queensland Aphasia Research Centre located at the University of Queensland. I'm Caroline Baker, co-facilitator of the seminar today. I acknowledge that this event and attendee, our attendees are located on the lands of many traditional custodians in Australia. We pay our respects to our First Nations peoples, elders past, present and emerging, and extend this respect to any First Nations peoples joining us online today. We are excited to cross international borders from Australia to the UK, while gathering many attendees here and internationally for today's presentation. The seminar will be presented by Professor Alex Leff. Unfortunately, Professor Jenny Crinion is unable to join us today. Before the formal introduction of Professor Alex Leff, let's briefly cover some housekeeping. Please be patient with us today with the technology and we apologise in advance if there are any disruptions to your viewing during the seminar. The seminar is being recorded today via Zoom and will be available to access along with past webinar videos via the Aphasia CRE website. Just click on the resources tab. The videos are usually uploaded uh, two weeks after each seminar. Enter your questions today anytime throughout the presentation uh, on your Zoom uh, webinar function below on the screen, you'll be able to enter your questions at any time and you'll be able to see the questions asked by other attendees. You can like or upvote a question to show those of most interest to the group. Our present, um, Professor Alex Leff will answer as many questions as time will allow at the end of this presentation. Please reserve this Q&A space for questions only and no other comments. And as you know, we're on social media, so please engage with us today on Twitter and Facebook. Feel free to tweet along today and you can use the hashtags aphasiacre and the hashtag Quark. And uh, if you haven't already done so, please get involved. You can join the community of practice at the Aphasia CRE. And you can also become an affiliate of the Queensland Aphasia Research Centre. Both centres welcome people with aphasia, their family, friends, health professionals, researchers and organisations to get involved. Benefits of getting involved include updates about events and activities and contributions to research. Both the CRE and Quark are always seeking financial support. If you wish to donate, please see the details on our websites. As I mentioned earlier, Professor Alex Leff will present the seminar today and also on behalf of Professor Jenny Crinion, who's unable to be with us. Thank you so much, Alex. Professor Leff is Professor of Cognitive Neurology and a consultant neurologist at the University College London Queen Square Institute of Neurology. His main clinical and academic interest is in cognitive rehabilitation, especially in the field of acquired language disorders and vision. Professor Leff is developing mechanistic accounts of how cognitive disorders can be improved by different types of therapy, mainly behavioral, using functional and structural brain imaging. He has developed three web-based rehabilitation tools that can be used by therapists and patients with hemianopia or reading problems, and is working on four other electronic therapy projects sponsored by the Medical Research Council, National Institute for Health Research, and the Stroke Association in the UK. Professor Leff thinks that web-based applications are a good way to make scientifically proven behavioural therapies available to patients and their therapists. 
He has a specialist outpatient multidisciplinary team assessment clinic for patients with hemianopia and or higher disorders of vision at the University College London Hospitals, National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. He also helps run the Queen Square Intensive Comprehensive Aphasia Program. Many thanks, Alex, for joining us today. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Caroline, for that very fulsome uh, introduction. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen with everybody. Oh, not that one. Okay, hopefully you can see my slides. So um, thanks a lot for um, uh, the uh, opportunity to speak to you all today. It's, it's a great honour to speak to you this afternoon, afternoon where you are. It's a lovely sunny morning for us here in London. Um, as, as Caroline pointed out, I'm interested in, in web-based apps and things like that, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, we're going to talk about the, um, the ICAP, the Intensive Comprehensive Aphasia Programme. Uh, that we set up and ran here for a year and um, it got paused because of covid um, and we're hopefully starting it again uh, in the autumn um, depending on how things go but that's that's the, um, the current plan so this is a picture of the team here um, here i am here's jenny who unfortunately can't make it today everybody else in the picture apart from me is a speech and language therapist um, which which is great and they really did all the um, heavy lifting and hard work um, just ahead of time none of the none of the none of the sort of therapy components uh, that were part of this service are really radical or different. I think the only thing that was perhaps dif different about it is the way that we sort of package them together to get the high dose in. And of course, I'm not going to do a history or, or review of ICAPs, but we're certainly not the first. There's been at least 10, um, several in Australia. We were able to put this together though within our National Health Service, which is a first, um, with, with funding from the National Brain Appeal, um, who, who fundraise for um, uh, clinical um, projects here at Queen Square and the Tavistock Trust for Aphasia, which uh, some of you will know. Um, and I'm funded by the NIHR, which is kind of the academic wing of the NHS. So uh, just a quick overview, uh, it may, may be preaching to the choir a bit, but I'm going to talk a little bit about why we need effective rehabilitation services, why aphasic patients need high dose therapy, uh, then I'll go into a description of the service um, and then show you outcome data, mainly at three weeks and three months, although there's one bit of data at six months um, from the first year. And the number of patients uh, is, is not big because these uh, these are very intensive programs, um, but most of the data I'm going to show you is from 46 patients. Um, in fact, we only had one dropout. We had 47 patients enrolled and one dropped out after the first week. Um, and Jenny sort of um, recruited them from her clinic. She was pretty good at picking uh, who, is, who, who had the sort of necessary resilience to tolerate such high dose therapy. Um, I'm going to take you through a statistical analysis of the impairment based outcomes and the functional outcomes which have just recently been published in stroke um, but I've just added in we've, we've done an analysis of some patient um, uh, reported outcome measures um, mood and also some goals um, so there's quite a lot of data to get through but I, I will show you all of those uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about effect sizes because I think it's important for everybody to think about those, not just about whether something's statistically significant um, on, on significance testing. Um, and then I'm going to go a little bit qualitative, although we haven't done a former, formal qualitative analysis yet, but that the, we've got a master's student working on this with um, one of the psychologists I work with. But I'm going to give you some examples of the sort of SMART goals that were set um, by the therapist in negotiation with the patients because I think in a way that's probably the best actual description of the service um, that you're likely to get and then if there's time I'm just going to sort of um, if you'll allow me just do it not it's not really a case study I'm just going to play audio of a patient um, pre and post um, again a lot of you know what aphasia sounds like but I think this is a, a useful example it doesn't take very long and then uh, we'll go to summary and outstanding issues and then your questions so um, as many of you know, aphasic stroke is very common. Roughly about a third of, of patients who have a, a hospitalizing stroke will, will have some form of language or communication uh, problem. This graph that shows a pretty flat line just shows that the instance of stroke is, is not budging much in the UK. I'm guessing it's pretty similar 
um, in Australia. Um, so the instance of stroke is not, not changing, but the prevalence is going up. And the reason the prevalence is going up is because improvements in acute care, where a lot of our resources uh, have been quite rightly focused on saving lives, means that uh, the majority of stroke patients do survive. Um, the five-year survival rate for an inpatient stroke is, is well above 80% now, which always surprises me when I hear that. When I started, um, well, maybe two decades ago now, roughly a third of stroke patients uh, were expected to die and therefore did die. So um, these numbers are from the Stroke Association. They might be a little bit inflated um, because they do have a vested interest in this, um, but they are predicting quite a steep rise in the number of people at any one time um, who, who have survived their stroke and maybe they're not too far off. So in other words, this, is, this problem that we already see in front of us today is only gonna get worse. Okay, inpatient therapy, what do patients get? We run a uh, but actually a very good audit called the Sentinel Stroke National Audit Program. I don't know if you have something similar in Australia. Actually, it's changed a bit. Uh, it changed just after November 2016. They started collecting a different type of data with not so much granularity, um, but it, it was collected at high granularity um, uh, and I think has been very useful and gave a breakdown for each of the, um, amongst other things, what the allied healthcare professionals were actually delivering. Um, which was really useful. So we know, or we, we know from about five years ago, and there's no real reason to suspect this has changed very much, um, what patients actually got. So I am going to make the slides available as PDFs, and I, I apologise that the, um, I hate it when people show slides where they can't read anything, um, but I will give these to you, but this is a table from that. Um, and what it, what it shows is, is um, well, the first thing is that the average stay in an acute stroke unit is about 17 days now in the UK. It used to be about double this. Uh, of course, generally speaking, it's good that patients um, get discharged home early. Most patients want to be at home. Hospitals are relatively dangerous places. Um, so it's good that that's come down. But the sort of downside is that patients got a lot of their therapy um, as an inpatient. Uh, in the past. Uh, and so there was a plan in the UK to try and make up this gap um, by something called the early supported discharge team. So the idea was, was that you would get discharged into the community. And if, if and only if you'd had a stroke, you would get rapid access um, to therapy in the community. And that's been rather patchy, frankly. So you're in for 17 days on average. Uh, roughly half stroke patients need to see a speech and language therapist. That's no big surprise because not just seeing them for language, seeing them also for swallowing problems. Um, the number of minutes um, that you will see a speech therapist for is, is around about 32 minutes um, if you get to see a speech therapist on a given day. And we have this kind of thing in the UK of a sort of golden 40 minutes. It's not entirely clear what that's come from. It's certainly not evidence-based and nothing to do with neuroscience. But uh, the average session is supposed to be around 40 minutes when it was actually measured in terms of what the therapists were doing with the patient. They averaged about 32 minutes per session. But you won't see a speech therapist on every single day. We are working towards seven day working with there's some reluctance over that um, part, and of course it costs money. Um, but you'll see um, a therapist roughly half the time, roughly half the day. So if you're in hospital for 10 days, you'll see a speech and language therapist for about five of them. So if you multiply all those numbers together, you end up with something just around about four hours of total therapy. Uh, and we know that patients will get about another eight sessions in the community. We could be generous and say that's eight hours of therapy. It probably isn't, but um, we can, and, that, and that's the average kind of dose that we know that patients are getting. Has anybody noticed? Yes, there's often uh, articles in the newspaper where stroke survivors are feeling that they're dumped, having to pay for their own therapy. Uh, and of course, COVID, if anything, has made um, this considerably worse. What does the evidence base say that we should have? This is still my favorite meta-analysis of um, speech and language therapy, although there's been some great Cochrane reviews led by um, Marion Brady and others. But I, I like this, and, and many of you will perhaps know this paper, um, but the, the kind of um, sort of boiled down message is that they looked at all of the sort of phase two studies, so the kind of work that I do and, and Dave Copland and others do. So, you know, relatively, high intense but small trials on, on sort of 10s, 20 or 30 patients. Um, they looked at the published data from that, so not at, not at clinical services, and just um, divided all the studies into two piles, whether there was a significant improvement in functional communication or if there wasn't a significant improvement in functional uh, communication. And then they asked from these two different um, sets of studies, uh, was there any systematic difference between the two sets? And the answer was, Yes, and it was dose. Um, so the positive studies had about 100 hours of therapy and the negative studies had about 44 hours of therapy. That's not to say that patients 
won't benefit, but on average as a group, those, those negative studies had 44 hours of therapy. So it gives you a ballpark, or it's given me a ballpark for that. Um, this is just another way of ramming that home. Um, you can also think a little bit about um, normal learning, how long it takes to learn a hard language. For example, this is American data. So to learn a, a, a difficult language, which for an English speaker would be something like Russian or, or, or Chinese, um, to get up to what's called level two, which is nobody would mistake you for a, for a local, but you could get by in shops and restaurants, that sort of thing. Um, you need about uh, 460, 480 hours um, of, of um, language learning. If it's an easy language, so from English to French or Spanish or possibly German, it's about half that. Um, positive speech and language studies there at 100 hours, negative studies there at 44, and UK NHS down there at about 12. And I think this is just to really illustrate why, uh, I don't know how much it happens in Australia, but um, in the UK there are a variety of clinicians, not speech therapists, often medics, who just think that speech and language therapy just doesn't work, why bother? And to be generous to them, it may be that they're really um, expressing the fact that it doesn't work in the, in the sort of doses that are given on average. So we tend to give a rather fair dose to everybody. So everybody gets underdosed, which is kind of fair in one sense, but really unfair in another sense. Well, you know, maybe obviously resource allocation is, is a tricky issue. Um, it's a hot potato. Maybe, um, maybe money sh should be spent on other things like cancer, um, you know, musculoskeletal disorders, there's, you know, health budgets just seem to keep getting inflated all the time. Um, so maybe, you know, we're busy advocating for, for aphasia, but, you know, we've all got a vested interest in it and maybe it's just not that bad to have. This is a great study that uh, Bruce Crosson um, alerted me to, and I've got all the references uh, in the last slide, which again, I'll share with you. Um, so this is a great Canadian study that I wasn't aware of. And it was a huge survey where they looked at the relationship between, I don't really know why they had 60 diseases and 15 conditions, they, they all seem interchangeable to me, but they basically had 75 disease or condition labels um, that they could uh, add to patients and patients could of course have more than one label and they were all in residential care homes so they were quite old um, they were un unable to at some level unable to uh, self self care or look after themselves completely independently um, uh, and what was amazing with this is just the sheer numbers so they got through um, 66,000 residents in this five-year period so I think this is the biggest survey of, of this type that has ever been done or ever will be done and then they just did a simple correlation between um, the disease labels and uh, the quality of life scores that the patients gave. And um, because of the amount of data that they had, they could um, work out um, the sort of partial effects of having each individual diagnosis as well as looking um, at combinations of them. So uh, obviously I wouldn't be showing you this unless aphasia was at the top, but indeed it is. So according to this, uh, they rank them on this last column, which is where it's adjusted for a variety of other um, coefficients or covariates or explanatory variables if you like such as age and a few other things um, but aphasia comes out top whether you use the raw score or the adjusted score here and this is based on almost 5,000 patients and according to this your quality of life is more negatively impacted by aphasia than it is by cancer, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's career, um, any other form of dementia, quadriplegia, cerebral palsy, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is a sort of North American term for motor neuron disease. So it's pretty unpleasant having aphasia. It is something that, that we should be focusing on and improving. Okay, so what have we decided to do about it? And here's my picture of Jenny, who again apologizes for not being able to be here today for health reasons. Um, but Jenny and I um, sort of set up this idea, copying really uh, what other people had done before, to come up with this intensive comprehensive aphasia program. Um, what did that mean? Well, intensive meant that we took sort of cohorts of four patients and we wanted to get to the magic Bogle 100 hours. I have to say we didn't quite manage it, um, but the idea was to bring them in uh, Monday to Friday into the hospital, but they wouldn't stay overnight. So it's what we call a day attender. Um, so I guess it's a bit like a chemotherapy patient might come in for their, their chemotherapy, but they wouldn't stay overnight in the hospital. It's a bit like that. They're coming in for their therapy um, and they're basically spending nine to five um, in the hospital um, building, getting their therapy from the therapist. And we were aiming for seven and a half hours a day of therapy, which is, of course, a huge amount. Um, we, we averaged around about six hours a day, which is still pretty, pretty good. Um, and we brought them in for three weeks, Monday to Friday. So they got 15 days of six hours of therapy on average. So that's the intensive bit. 
Um, the comprehensive bit is um, that we had basically two um, qualified speech and language therapists, two therapy assistants, and this was really important. We had half the psychology, um, actually quite a senior psychologist um, uh, involved, and this, this was actually really useful. The psychologist didn't just do psychometric assessment of our patients, which is something I think that is important uh, because a lot of aphasic patients do have um, deficits in other cognitive areas, um, but also offered psychological interventions, both at the individual patient level and also working more systematically systemically with, with uh, their family or, or um, significant others. So this was, was, a, was a really useful part of the service that perhaps if there is anything novel about our service, I think it was this. But you can see there's pretty much one-to-one. -one. So for every patient, there's a therapist. So this is very, um, in some ways, it's very expensive in terms of therapist time. Um, but well, maybe we'll have a discussion about whether it's worth it. What did we do? We set individualized goals and uh, we had a whole bunch of um, uh, basically did everything and anything. So we had one-to-one -one sessions, we had pairs, dyads, we had groups, we used apps, we used conversation partner training. So we, we did bring in um, their partners or significant others when and where we could. Um, and the program itself, there was an assessment day, in fact, sometimes two days before they came in where they had their psychological assessment and, and did some goal setting. So we kind of had some things set before they sort of hit the ground. Then they did the three week intervention and the plan was to do outcomes at three months, six months and 12 months. This got uh, scuppered by COVID, unfortunately. Um, so the, the, it's not a randomized control trial. Patients were not randomized into therapy or not therapy. This is effectively really a service evaluation, but we kind of ran it as a scientific project. And I, I hope you'll, you'll, so we built in some things which would mitigate against some of the, um, the flaws in not having um, a control group or a control period. You could, of course, run this thing as a waitlist control, but we decided not uh, to do that because of the way we had our funding. And this was another thing we built in because of just of the way that quarters work is 13 weeks and a quarter. Every quarter we had a reflection week for the treating team. And this was really important to give them some time to catch up and, and discuss what was working and what wasn't working so well. And when we restart, we're gonna bring in some changes um, from the treating team. Um, who was it for? Um, so it's adults living in the community. Um, so they had to be physically independent. Um, if they lived near enough to the hospital, they would go home each evening to their bed or home. Uh, if they were a little bit further away, we did have hotels. So we had in the budget that they could stay in a local hotel. I have to say not a great hotel, but um, it was close and they would come in each, each morning, um, either from a cab or make their own way in. So they had to be basically in the chronic phase and, and able to self care. And we, could, we did take a couple of patients who were wheelchair, in a wheelchair, so they, they could still sell self care. Um, and of course the hospital is wheelchair accessible. Um, but we didn't take patients in the acute phase or those that uh, couldn't look after themselves. Um, they were allowed to have cognitive impairments. Um, this thing that Jenny and I talk about a lot about capacity for change, we kind of know, I think you all know what that means when you see a patient. It's a kind of feeling that you get, um, but we're, we're still not quite sure how best to, to quantify this. Um, and as I say, Jenny had a very good touch for that because the majority of patients that she picked um, were able to at least stay the course. Of course, not all of them improved. Um, and I'll show you some mood data. The idea was to take patients who, who were not so depressed that they couldn't, um, they couldn't uh, take part in the program. So there was a bit of screening out there. And if, if patients were, did have very low mood, we, we, we would often try and get them to work on that with somebody in the community and come back when their mood had improved. Although they did get some psychological input, but we wanted to take people who could really benefit from day one. Uh, we only, ex in terms of the aphasia profile, we did exclude some patients who had severe apraxia of speech, but as you know, most patients uh, who've got a speech production problem have got, often have got some element of speech apraxia. Uh, and again, they had to have the cognitive ability to work independently or in groups because we weren't just offering one-to-one -one sessions. Um, again, had to be feasible. They had to give up three weeks of their life. Some of these patients were in work um, and we wanted to get their work family and friends come in for the conversation partner training. They often said that they, somebody would come in and then in reality, we couldn't get them to come in Monday to Friday. And one of the things we're thinking of doing next time we start is having a, one of the therapy days being a weekend day, a Saturday, which might help. All right, again, this is, this is rather busy, but this is, this is uh, the columns are time points uh, and the rows are all the things we measured. And this is the sort of more scientific side of things that we brought to it. So there, there was the pre-therapy assessment and you can see we assessed quite a lot of things. Then this green bar is the three weeks of high dose therapy, the ICAP. And then we measured some things immediately post-therapy, but it doesn't make sense to measure everything immediately post-therapy. For instance, uh, the functional outcomes, it doesn't make sense because they're not actually properly in the community. They've just spent three weeks with us. Um, 
Uh, then we measured at three months, six months, and 12 months. Unfortunately, COVID did for the 12 month. Um, at the impair, and, and we used the kind of ICF framework. So we, at the impairment level, we used the CAT. Um, at, the, at the function level, so this is a carer reported outcome measure, we used the SETI. Um, we, on mood, we, uh, we wanted to use something called the DVAMs, which we really liked, but in the end, it was too difficult to collect that data. And we went back to using a rather basic assessment of mood called the DISCs, which some of you will be aware of, and I'll show you some of that data. Um, and then we also looked at quality of life, both um, uh, patient reported quality of life, which I'm going to show you today, and also care re reported, which we haven't analysed yet. Um, we did these at multiple time points. So the CAT, we did pre-therapy, immediately post-therapy, and at three months, I'm going to show you that data first. And that data was worked out by Sarah Nightingale, who's a speech and language therapist who, who worked on this for a master's programme. I'm going to show you the SETI um, at pre and at six, at three months. Uh, then we're going to move to the um, patient reported outcome measure, the SACQUAL. Uh, but actually, we measured only two of the domains. We didn't measure the physical domain. Um, and then mood, we did measure before three months and six months. And now all of these all of these assessments are, um, are standardised, which is is good in many ways. Um, the only non-standardised test we had was the goal-based one, which was the GAS. Some of you will know the GAS, the goal attainment scaling. And I'm going to finish with that and show you a bit of data, both the qualitative and, and uh, uh, some, uh, sorry, quantitative and some qualitative. So quite a lot to get through. Um, so this is, this is who we treated. So I mentioned that we have treated 46. For this analysis, because it's a um, repeated measures and over, if you've just got a single cell, a single piece of data missing for a single subject, that subject is dropped out. So for most analyses, I'll show you there's actually 36 patients. The median age was 50, which is certainly young. If you look at um, a lot of publications on aphasia, uh, the median age is often around a bit older than this. And they, certainly the average age of someone having a stroke in the, in the UK is 70, but it's very rare in these studies to have people averaging about 70. So they're certainly at the younger end. The median time since stroke uh, is, is more than two years out. Again, there's this story that patients don't change once they get past six months or 12 months or two years. And as I'll show you, that's just not true. And the gender bias towards males and females, I think is primarily because of this. So the younger you are, the more the balance is towards males and females. As you get towards 80s and 90s, the balance flips the other way because women live longer. Um, again, in the CAT, we've split it up into these four main domains. Um, so speaking and writing on the production side, um, listening and reading on the perception side. So I'm going to show you the, just going to dive into the results straight away. Uh, this is the most complicated set of results. So this is the uh, CAT data, which you're looking at here um, across the four domains here and across the three time points. So the baseline measurement, and then at three weeks, so at three weeks, so between the dark blue and the mid blue, that's um, before and after the three week ICAP program. Uh, and then in the light blue is three months later. Now, they kind of almost sort of fell off a cliff after the ICAP. So uh, although we did see them again at three months and we did do some onward referrals to community services, we didn't keep treating after the three week period. So they didn't continue to have intensive therapy or really any therapy from us. Um, uh, in that in that three week to three month period. So we carried out a two ways repeated measures ANOVA uh, with the domain has got four levels, which I've told you the speaking, writing, writing, listening and reading. And then time has three levels pre post at three weeks and post at three months. There was a significant time by domain interaction. Uh, and you can kind of see it here that speech production, if you think about this as a, as a sort of uh, line of best fit, this this has got a steeper curve than any of the others, but they're all got a, a positive um, uh, uh, line, if you like. Um, and there's, so there's a significant domain by time interaction, which is important because as I've said, there's no control group. And when you get significant domain by time interactions, it's very hard to explain this data in terms of a test retest effect or a placebo effect um, or a bias effect, a systematic bias in data collection. Um, however, we did also look at each domain individually and those were also significant. Uh, and when we did the paired post hoc tests, it really demonstrated what you can kind of see here, that what was driving the interaction was that the, the, the patient's speaking outcomes improved. Uh, this was on spoken picture description. This is written picture description um, that, that they really got uh, significantly better on speaking as opposed to the three other domains. We then did a MANCOVA, so this is just putting in the raw data, but you can add in covariates um, of no interest if you like, um, or other explanatory variables. So we added in age, gender, and time since stroke, and the, the main interaction still remained uh, significant. In other words, it didn't really matter how old you were, what gender you were, or how long it was since you'd had your stroke, the, these effects still survived. 
and then that you can kind of see the three weeks to three months there's a bit of an improvement here it's gone down a bit here it's gone up here and gone up here it was statistically significant i'm not saying it was clinically relevant but there was statistically significant improvement at three months compared to three weeks for speaking um, and listening which i think is interesting and something that the upper limb um, uh, program that also runs here that we, is also an intensive program for patients with a weak upper limb and um, they also saw that some of these improvements um, continue to significantly improve further down the line which we could talk about a bit as to why that might happen but clearly the main effect was was after the three weeks um, the SETI or some people pronounce it KETI is a functional outcome it's a, a care reported outcome measure and um, there's 16 questions um, uh, like this uh, some of you will know them uh, and we just average across those uh, this is simpler it's um it's just a pair t test because we're just looking at the baseline in three months we don't measure this at three weeks and there is a statistically significant difference here uh, very significant uh, the mean change is just over 12 and from the original paper on the SETI the clinically important improvement um, which is another way of looking at effect sizes is, is anything over 11.4 so we've got a clinically important improvement in the SETI here I'm just going to mention a little bit about effect sizes. This is something I'm a little bit obsessed with, but I think it's important. And there's different ways of thinking about them. In short, there are two main ways of thinking about effect sizes, uh, what are called standardized and unstandardized. An unstandardized effect size is simply how much change has there been, a percentage improvement. But actually, there's at least five different ways of calculating that. You'd be surprised. A standardized effect size just um, is a linear mix of the amount of change plus the variance associated with that change. So some people prefer that. Um, it's just a bit less intuitive. So the way that we uh, looked at our percentage is certainly for the cat, there is an aphasic cutoff because the cat was a test that was also carried out with a bunch of people who had a stroke but weren't aphasic um, and they're not on the ceiling. So we said that that was a reasonable, if we could get our patients back to the aphasic cutoff because of course they've still had their stroke, then that's kind of our goal. So uh, our goal is, is, to, is to shift this arrow uh, up to the aphasic cutoff. This is what we achieved, shifting up here so they're, they're certainly not back to normal but they've improved substantially and it's just a, a percentage is just a ratio of those two so and what, what, what we call percentage back to normal and that's our unstandardized effect size and then we use this repeated measures Cohen's D um, for our standardized effect size um, basically anything for the Cohen's D anything above five um, is considered a medium effect size and anything above point, sorry, 0.5 anything above 0.8 is considered a large effect size so you can see we've got large effect sizes for speaking and writing and the functional outcome okay and this is just a um it's literally came out two days ago so it's just to say if you want to the data i've shown you up till now is is in this paper in stroke it's a, a brief report fairly easy to read um so that's there for you if you want to get a bit more details Okay, so this is uh, the quality of life scale. So this is the SACWOL. Um, we just did two out of three domains. They're split into communication and psychosocial. This is the work done by the treating psychologist on the team, Camille Julian, um, who's moved to another community rehab team now. Uh, and this is basically, again, uh, it, well, this is a Likert scale between zero and five, and you just average over all of the questions. And this is the data here. So this is uh, the communication questions averaging over those. And this is the psychosocial questions. So it's a two by two and over. So the domain here, there's just two domains, communication, psych psychosocial. And there's just two time points because we measured this pre and at three months. Again, there was no point measuring it at three weeks. Uh, we've got a main effect of time. Um, but again, importantly, we've got a domain by time interaction. In other words, they improved significantly more on the communication uh, domain than they did on the psychosocial domain, even though they did improve on both. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody knows, this is Hilari's work, I don't know if anybody knows if, if anyone, if there is a sort of minimally important clinical difference uh, or, or clinically important uh, change, I couldn't find it for this, but they have got a responsiveness uh, metric for each of these. So the responsiveness responsiveness metric for a change in communication is, a, is around 0.38 and we got 0.98 so about double that and for psychosocial it's around 0.2 and again we got double that so we certainly it's very unlikely this is measurement noise I suppose it, it's it's well outside um, the or well inside the sensitivity of, of these measures so again it's a nice nice result I think uh, we wanted to use the DVAMs, which uh, I haven't got time to go into, but it's, it's really for patients with aphasia. It looks across a whole variety of, of moods um, and emotions, not just one. Um, and it's all pictorial, which I really like, um, but it was just too complex to use. In the end, we ended up using this DISCS thing, which is really very basic. Uh, this is the aphasic 
a version. Um, I don't know who drew these faces with the, the sort of smiley face here. I don't think it's quite funny, but this, this is now sort of everybody uses this scale. So these slightly wonky, unhappy and happy faces are now out there forever, I think. Uh, and it's just a simple Likert scale from zero to six for most severe depression, down to no depression. Uh, again, we did a seri series of, of t-tests, and um, these are the number of the patients that were available. As you can see, we had less data available at six months again, an effect of COVID, um, and low scores are better. Uh, and we did get a significant uh, difference between pre and three months and pre and six months. But the caveat is the scores were low anyway. Uh, and generally, well, with this score, you need to score two or above to be counted as depressed. So all this is really telling you, I think, is that the patients that we took into the study were not clinically depressed, either mild, moderate or severe. And although their mood improved, I'm not sure this is clinically significant or relevant, really, um, because they weren't depressed to come in with. But I thought I'd share the data with you anyway. So this is the last set of data I'm going to show you. Um, this is the goal attainment scale. It's got both a quantitative um, and a, a qualitative aspect. Um, it, it, we, we got the patients to set short, medium, long term and economic goals. I really wanted to set economic goals because one of the big, I knew this service was going to be expensive and, and we wanted to get it commissioned, which is, means getting the NHS to pay for it. And you need to, you need to show that it's worth it. And a lot of the economic tools out there, some of you will, will be familiar with the EQ5D, which is used in some aphasia studies. And I really think it shouldn't be. If you look at the EQ5D, the five questions, there's only one that could potentially be moved by somebody, even if you went from severely aphasic to completely back to normal, um, there's only one of those five domains that would shift. So I, I just think we should not use tools that, that cannot are not fit for purpose. So um, I wanted to try and capture it and it's a bit novel, but as I say, we, and I'll show you some, we, we set some economic goals um, for the patients. Now, this is the GAS score. Again, a pair, some paired T-tests before and after. Um, it won't surprise you, those are the numbers. It won't surprise you to hear that these are all highly statistically significant. Generally speaking, one should set goals that are attainable. Of course, patients may not attain all of their goals, um, but, but the whole point of goal setting and goal negotiation is that it, that it is an achievable goal. So perhaps it's not surprising um, that these came out as statistically significant early different over time. Um, the clinically important improvement, uh, according to Lynn Turner-Stokes, who came up with this, is, is, is 10. So you can see across all of these four types of goals, we're um, numerically above that. I just wanted to spend a bit of time, uh, there's a lot of text coming up over the next, um, next four slides, but I wanted to spend a bit of time on this and I'm going to read them out because these are the goals that were set. These are across multiple subjects. I sort of fairly randomly chose them. And I just think it, it gives you, um, it gives you an idea of, of what the service was. I think in many ways, this is a, as good a description of the service as any, because this is, this is, these are the goals that were set. So uh, to maintain a 15 minute supported conversation with friends in a noisy environment, to say my date of birth on the phone, e.g. to the doctor, to explain two ways aphasia affects me and two things which will help, to plan, type and edit an email, which includes prepositions, junctions and determiners. I mean, you can see that these are across subjects and there's a variety of severity across subjects. Um, and you can also see that not all of these goals are smart, but it's quite hard to come up with smart goals for absolutely everything. To make and use an aphasia card to support communication with strangers, to pre-plan an important phone call using a structure and reflect on what was useful. In three weeks, I'll be able to retrieve 19 practice words in a conversation or task or in therapy. So this is a very impairment-based goal. Um, to independently order my own decaf cappuccino using speech within three weeks, a functional goal for my sister and I to be able to identify three things that make our conversation easy between us. Again, very functional. These were the kind of the a flavor of the medium goals to have written my CV with support, share my aphasia card and talk once to the veterans group. This was a social group the patient was involved in. To use the simple past tense to talk about my weekend. Um, to rate my confidence after six months to have quicker pace, less hesitancy and pauses in my speech. To read from the Guardian and Financial Times requiring only one reread attempt. So not, not all of the, of the goals were to do with speech output, but you can see the bias in the therapy and this was driven as much by the patients as anybody else was on speech production to use strategies when reading a short children's story aloud and I'm, if, if I get time I'll show you the audio from that patient to support student learning through sharing my experience of aphasia so some of the patients wanted to reach out to others uh, for my sister and I to be able to write a short simple sentence here are the longer term goals at 12 months, which we weren't able to, uh, we had smaller numbers where we could collect the data on. So read a book, write about my travels, regularly attend and participate in a communication group, uh, rate my confidence as being a good dad and answering why. It's obviously young children involved there. Uh, to be following a structured timetable for the week, which supports good sleep hygiene and includes regular group activity. To be following a weekly timetable, 
to help X plan a surprise holiday for mummy's 80th birthday. So again, a very functional goal um, to go into the radio station and practice recording drops. We had a, a DJ who had an aphasic stroke uh, to give my presentation to sponsor of the MBA. So this is, this is the charity that supports us. And this was a patient who was particularly keen on, on sharing their story. Um, and then some of the economic ones. And you'll notice that, that not all of these are true vocational for those of you who are involved in vocational rehabilitation. A lot of these are pre voc goals or what's sometimes called work hardening. So be able to identify a plan for returning to work and managing my stress. This is a very stressful um, um, thing for this patient to do. Actively applying for paid alternative jobs in nine months time. So this is somebody already in a job, completed a CV, attend voc rehab program to secure and maintain a voluntary post in something I'm interested in. So again, pre voc to be following a stepwise plan towards paid employment by the end of the program, again, pre-voc, to read and respond to emails and texts without somebody's support, this is somebody at work, to have answered the telephone at this place of work on at least three occasions by my next review, um, and in 12 months time, contacted VOC rehab teams. So I took some time to read those out, but I think it's important, they give you a flavor of, of, of what we were trying to achieve. Okay, I, I'm just gonna share, the, the sound isn't brilliant on this, um, it's very short. So this is just a quick pre and post um, for Paul, one of the patients, his name does get mentioned and he's, he's fine for us to share these. So this is him before therapy and then I'm gonna play three weeks after. Living hard, far behind. Power born, glass, boiling milk, still down to walk, moving. All right, and you'll hear Beth, uh, who's the therapist, uh, sort of coaching him here, but this is him three weeks later. So now, yeah, using your finger and going slower. Bradley, fire up his engine. Use and, your finger, Paul. And launch his rocket into space. His rocket climb higher and higher, leaving earth far away behind okay so just to wrap up um hopefully i've convinced you that we've developed and delivered an icap using this dual funding model which is is unusual for our country so charity and nhs i know you've done similar things in australia with with charity uh, funding uh, and other funding um it's what i would call um a kitchen sink approach uh to interventions uh, so it's not like we're doing anything terribly novel minute to minute or day to day, but it's just the packaging of them all, although perhaps including this psychology input, I would say is very important. Uh, rigorous approach to collecting outcome data across the ICF domains. I think without that, we wouldn't have got that paper in stroke. Um, uh, we've got effective large effect sizes across language domains, speech more than others on the impairment based stuff. Um, it's not out of keeping with other ICAPs, it's certainly up there, but it, 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 other ICAPs have shown this, we're not the first to show it. Um, and I've kind of labored the interactions, but they mitigate, mitigate against this kind of test retest bias as an explanation. Um, it always worries me when I read studies where absolutely everything got better all the time, you know, is it placebo effect or not? And, and that could be leveled at some of our findings, but I think for the ones where there's an interaction, it's, it's almost impossible um, to explain it in terms of a test retest or bias. So the last sort of points to think about before we get to uh, questions, um, cost sustainability. So uh, the National Brain Appeal who funded this, they basically funded the on costs, which was 90% salaries, and the hospital gave us space, which is why we're having trouble getting back because we're having trouble finding space po post COVID. And it costs 300,000 uh, pounds per annum, which per patient works out at about five and a half thousand pounds. But this is how much a hip replacement costs. And I think, you know, we should be honest about um, how much we cost, um, but that we, we give these big effects. And, you know, nobody questions somebody going in for a hip replacement. Um, we're hoping to restart the service. It keeps getting knocked back. We're hoping to start again in September um, this year with a, a four by four by four model. So that's treating four patients at a time over four weeks instead of three and over four days. So they'll end up with 16 days. So it's a bit more of a distributed model and it gives the therapists a day to catch up with all their paperwork because they really were burning out at the end of that first year and there just wasn't enough time for them to catch up with everything. We're hoping to get what we call NHS commissioning in about a year's time. We'll just have to see what happens with that because all the money may have gone to COVID. Um, and roll out to other territories, we're keen. Um, I think the most important part of that paper, apart from the, the data I've shown you, is in the supplementary materials. We put quite a comprehensive, tidier description of service in there. Um, so to some extent, people could copy it, I, I think, although you won't find any big surprises in the tidier description. Okay, uh, those are the references which I'll make sure I make available to you and I will stop screen sharing and happy to take questions. 
Oh, thank you so much, Alex, for such a fascinating and thorough talk and congratulations on this um, brilliant study. Um, it's so impressive how you've implemented this into the clinical setting in the UK. Um, we've got quite a number of questions, so let's have a look at those. Um, Annabelle asks, are you particularly meaning underdosed in the chronic phase as the newer studies, for example, VERSE here in Australia, seem to indicate that lower doses of intervention in acute and subacute settings has better functional outcomes? Yeah, I know the VERSE study and I, I know that there was a huge, huge problems with getting it published uh, and I know they did, did their best um, um, and I spoke there in, I, I know they did their best to, to, to get a reasonable dose in and to look at dose effects, but I still think that was, was a bit underdosed. I think in the acute, I mean, a lot of the work I do, a lot of the work that's been done um, is in the chronic phase, uh, both in the UK and America and to some extent in Australia. It's, it's hard to do work in the acute phase. Uh, RG Hillis has done some, although it's more neuroscientific. Everyone's I think people are a little bit obsessed with the acute phase. It is the time when spontaneous biological recovery, which has got a whole bunch of mechanisms, is at its most extreme. So people are rapidly changing. Just because someone's rapidly changing, it doesn't, I don't think it necessarily follows that they're going to be most responsive to an outside input of a complex intervention, such as which is what speech therapy is. It's an open question. So uh, I don't know in the acute phase. I would say uh, all bets are still off intellectually and from all the evidence in the chronic phase nothing to me suggests that less is more in other words if you do less therapy you'll get better outcomes than if you do more therapy it just doesn't make sense to me the human expert performance literature doesn't make sense learning doesn't make sense distributed stuff so stuff that jade um has, has done with david i think is great and i would rather do this distributed i'd rather give 100 hours or 90 hours over many weeks or months it's just the cost implications are huge so we concertina it all together to reduce the cost but i don't think that's the best way to do it okay thank you um also do you think the aphasia prevalence will continue to rise with stroke prevalence with new medical treatment for example um elective clot retrieval uh, yes. So I don't know what, the same thing happened and still happens with uh, thrombolysis. So generally speaking, at the best hospitals, uh, th they thrombolyze about 10% of patients. And I don't know what the ECR thing is. It cannot get higher than that. For ECR, you have to have a large clot in a proximal artery. It does do amazing things. The numbers, to, numbers needed to treat are something like two. Uh, so it's one of the few things that's more effective than the stroke unit where the numbers needed to treat are about four or six. Uh, that is to prevent a, a death. The numbers needed to treat for aspirin is about 73. So you need to treat 73 patients with aspirin to stop one stroke. Um, so the effect sizes for that are, are huge, but the numbers of people who can benefit from it directly is small. All patients, all patients uh, benefit in the acute phase by having very well organized acute services. And actually that's what saves lives is having a stroke unit, not having um, ECR. So ECR is great, it's not an enemy of us. It will, it will make, mean there are less aphasic patients. Out of every 100 aphasic patients, there'll be a few less, um, but it will not get rid of it um, because the majority of strokes cannot be retrieved. Thank you. Nicole um, says she's interested that you've repeated the cat so many times so close together. Is there no potential learning effect? Uh, I, my anecdotal experiences is not. I've done studies where I've done it every six weeks, seven times. Um, David Howard and Swinburne and the others are always very keen to, to point out that it has got very robust um, test retest effects, not much learning. Having said all of that, I don't believe there's a single neuropsychological test that you can't learn on. So I think you're right. Generally, when I do this, the more kind of a controlled clinical trial, I will always have two baselines before there's any intervention and sometimes three, which mitigates many of these, but not all of the learning effects. There's some arguments you just keep learning over time. But as I've said, any interaction, you would have to say that they learned more on the spoken picture description than they did on the written picture description. There's a systematic learning bias related to the test, not to the therapy, it's hard to swallow. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam Harvey asks, in previous large studies, for example, Brichtenstein's et al. 2017, there's a subset of participants who seem to drive the overall effect, responders. Were there people who did and didn't respond to treatment in this study? And drawing on your experience, what factors might explain treatment response? 
Well, I wish I wish I knew the answer to the second bit. I think we will get there eventually. It's obviously nothing obvious. Otherwise, we would know by now. Um, but I think it's a mixture of things. I've talked about this um, capacity to learn or capacity to respond. Um, it's not just a clinical gut feeling. It must be something that we could quantify. Without going into a long answer, it actually looks like a baseline MRI brain scan may be just as good at capturing um, any of any of the sort of cognitive things you might think of as a whole battery of cognitive tests. Like I say, we in other studies I've done, we've, we've done two days of cognitive testing and it's no better than an MRI scan, which can be done in 10 minutes in terms of explaining the variance. So now we're talking about explaining the variance to a fellow, to, a, to a, an intervention, uh, admittedly not the ICAP. So we would like to do that. Jenny plans to do that. So we didn't collect brain scans uh, on these patients, but the plan for the next year is to do that and look at exactly uh, uh, what you've said. Um, is it driven by some? Of course, you know, whenever you do group statistics like this, as I mentioned, you're looking at the effect size and then you're looking at the variability around it. And if those go, you have a big enough effect size or a small enough variance, um, then you get a statistically significant result. So either you have a small effect that's very tight, very little variance, or you have a big effect with lots of variance. And you, can, you know what it's going to be in this case. It's going to be a big effect with lots of variance. So some patients won't respond. Um, I don't know if we ever got a patient who didn't respond at all to any of the outcomes, but we definitely had some who didn't do very well on our outcomes. Um, we're definitely miles away from being able to uh, measure stuff and say, sorry, you're not going to benefit. I think it, we should go more in the way of, look, you, you, you're going to need to work twice as hard as, your, as the average patient to get the same benefit as the average patient. That's how I think we should couch it. And the Breitenstein, I agree, sorry, very quickly. Yeah. Um, I've been a bit critical of that paper. Uh, they did a sub-analysis uh, because the, on the main outcome measure they did, the ANALT um, A, um, there wasn't a clinically important difference. And they, I think they kind of hid that. But anyway, she had a go at me for that, fair enough. Uh, and if you look in the paper, which I have to admit, I didn't the first time I read it properly, but in the supplementary materials, there's a subgroup analysis and there was a subgroup of patients who got twice as much therapy and they did get over to the clinically important difference on the analt A. So I think it's partly that, that the dose did actually vary across the groups, although that wasn't immediately clear to me when I read the paper. Of course, there'll be other factors. We all know that. Thank you. Um, Linda Worrell says, nice results. There is no doubt in my mind that ICAPs work with good effect sizes. Cost effectiveness is the issue. How might you reduce the cost but maintain the outcomes? Uh, yeah, I wanted to give a flippant result to Linda. Um, we can, obviously we could chip away. So we've done a completely separate study we did. We did something called Enroll, which was neuro rehabilitation online. It wasn't particularly for aphasic patients. It was for people with acquired brain injury who missed out on therapy because of COVID. We've just published that in the JNMP. That was completely online and it was groups and it was carers and it was brilliant. Um, and it was cheaper at some level, but we still needed skilled therapists. In fact, we needed two therapists for each session. We couldn't run these sessions with eight to 12 patients. You couldn't run as a single uh, therapist. So we had two therapists, usually a psychologist, an OT, psychologist, physio, et cetera, et cetera, physio, OT. Uh, so that worked well. And I'm sure there's ways we can chip away at it. But what, what we mustn't do is, is undermine what, what therapists do. You know, therapists, whatever you think of speech and language therapy, I think of it as a complex intervention. It's, it's a skilled individual who, who delivers it, who's had four years or more of training and has got many, many years of, in, in practice. A bit like being a medic, you know, I trained for seven years. When I came out, I still had huge amounts to learn and I keep learning, it's great. That's, one of, that's why it's a good profession to go into. It's a lifelong learning profession, but they're, they're expensive. You know, you could say to the, could you make the hip replacement cheaper by using balsa wood? Yeah, you could. So I, I just, that was my flippant response. Um, so I think we can drive the cost down, but I, I just think we should, we've got to get out of this funding bracket. I mean, I've been asked this, you know, what, what money can you save the NHS? And I'm like, none, because there's no, there's no budget for aphasia. There's no NHS budget for aphasia. There's a budget for cancer. There's a bu budget for hips. There's a budget for heart disease. There's a budget for dementia. There's a budget for care homes. There's no budget for aphasia. So you can't say oh, I'm saving on the aphasia budget. It's like, you're not spending on it. Mm. So that's my attack. It costs money. It's a horrible thing to have. We should be spending on it. These people are being let down, not can we do the balsa wood hip. But having said that, of course, there are ways of driving the cost down. But I think we should be upfront that it takes trained healthcare professionals to deliver these kinds of effects. Lovely. Thank you. Alan Bernstein asks, would teletherapy reduce costs and enable more people to participate? 
So, yeah. I've kind of answered that. What yeah. we found in the end role was actually some of it's better. So the, the thing that was surprised me, we did a, a Catherine Dugan, who I showed you briefly, we did a care, well, she did, I didn't. She did a carer's cafe. And, and the one rule was the patients couldn't come. So the, the carers came to the cafe and they shared their stories and experiences. And that was amazing. Uh, and <clears throat> that's something that she's looking to take forward into a PhD now. And, and that to me was a real eye opener. I mean, I've always thought that carers mattered, <clears throat> but I've never really um, thought of focusing on them as a, as a therapeutic target. So, I mean, that's me. I've never thought of working systemically before, but it's really important. And actually doing it virtually while people are in their homes, um, if you get the right skilled person so that people will share, they'll actually do it more than if you do it in a church hall or half of them can't turn up. So I think there's, we've got to use the positives of that. I'm a, maybe I'm a bit of a lud. I, I think the idea of putting all rehab online or virtual, I don't think it's quite right. I mean, you, you know, I, can't, I get, keep getting told different things of what percentage of, of communication is not verbal. I'm a very verbal person. Um, but you, I find on Zoom hard to read people, hard to read the room. You know, if somebody's feeling <clears throat> psychologically <clears throat> not well or, you know, it's hard to pick that up, I think, on Zoom. Um, Nicole, Charles is interested in the demand for the, your service. How much demand was there? And could you fill places with local referrals or were they from further afield? So we started off with, like, it's a great question, it's very pragmatic. We started off with local uh, and we've moved a bit further afield. Uh, because of the pause in the service, we've already got 50 patients on the waiting list. So I, I think we're not short of patients. Of course, there is a bunch of patients that we're letting down where Jenny gets the feeling that they're not going to, you know, and you could say, is that right that one very senior therapist is deciding who comes in and who doesn't? It does seem to be working for us, but obviously it's biasing it. You know, we're picking patients who we think it's a bit self-referential, isn't it? So mm -hmm. that does need looking at, but at the, what, the reason we did that or the way we've We've justified it is that we only running this as a two year project, then it stops and we really want to get it commissioned. So we kind of it's a bit like a phase two study. We, it's like a, an efficacy study. We want to give ourselves the biggest chance of showing a big effect. Then we can start asking more clinical efficacy uh, um, uh, efficiency out. Sorry, I'm getting those mixed up. Um, effectiveness, clinical effectiveness study where you kind of apply it to lots of people. And then I'm sure we'll find people who can't tolerate it. You know, and some of the patients did have fatigue. They could only manage three hours. Then they were they were whacked. Mm -hmm. Miranda Rose asks, how many of the participants improved above meaningful change within each outcome measure? And were there any signals about responders and non-responders that can help with personalising treatment prescription for ICAPs? I mean, it's a great question, Miranda. The answer is we don't really know. I did have a table certainly for the cat where we were looking because again in the cat there is um, there, for every individual of those four outcome measures, there's a score above which they claim is, is clinically meaningful. It's quite high at seven or eight on a lot of them. And we did work out percentages and even for speech production there, I think it was around, we can't quote me on this, it was around 70%. If you looked across all four domains, you would generally find one, at least one that they had improved uh, a lot on. And of course that may have been one that they picked to work on because the therapy itself was, was obviously a negotiation between the therapist and the patient. So like you saw, Paul worked a lot on his reading, but other, other patients would not have worked on their reading at all. It wouldn't have been relevant or whatever. So I, I think that is important, but we've got, to, we've got to keep in mind that the therapy itself was not a, a, a sort of single, I've kind of sold it as a single package, but if you broke it down, it was, in, it was individualized. Mm. Um, and I'd be surprised if, 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 if patients wouldn't in general respond to one aspect or another. I think what we need are lower intensity versions of this for patients who just can't tolerate. You know, I mean, if you ask me to go down, you say, I want to get fit. I go, yeah. They go, we, okay, you're going to go down the gym every day. I was like, really? Every day for six hours? I'm not doing that. I don't want to get fit that badly. You know, so these patients are heavily invested and we need, some, we need a, a more spread out version. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a comment from Erin Gadecki. Intensity is different to amount. I agree that Verse was underdosed. Verse suggested a distributed regimen of nine hours of direct treatment was equal to a more intensive, greater amount of 22 hours of treatment. Yeah, I mean, Erin, we've discussed this uh, and I'm happy to discuss it. Uh, when, when two things are equivalent, that doesn't mean one's better than the other, obviously, scientifically speaking. Um, and I think that, I don't know, my explanation for your data, because I'm a bit of a dose monster, 
is that there's something about the acute or subacute phase and there may be a ceiling on that that we don't know about but i don't think you know i'm doing i'm about to say you can't project forward from the acute subacute into the chronic phase although i'm doing exactly that by projecting backwards from the chronic phase into the acute phase but maybe we can't maybe the early phases where patients do a lot of spontaneous biological recovery and it may be that they're relatively resistant to inputs then but i don't know i don't think anybody knows so the fact that the fact that 9 and 22 are equivalent doesn't mean that 22 is wrong it just means that it obviously seems inefficient or expensive but it doesn't mean that it's it's not more effective down the line and there's lots of evidence that in the chronic phase dose is important and certainly distributed you know the work that jade and david have done i think have shown that really nicely Thanks. so i don't disagree with your findings I, I like your findings i think they're they're a big step forward and it's a great study really hard to do and you deserve a lot of plaudits and i know it was nothing to do with me i wasn't a reviewer it was really hard to get that published i saw it was sitting on a bio archives for a couple of years so obviously somebody was blocking it thank you erin she's commented totally agree and we haven't got the dose right uh, Katarina Brittenstein um, asked, did you document interim SLT and or degree of language activities in the follow-up period? If yes, what were the effects on maintenance? So thanks, Katarina. I, we, we didn't do it properly. We didn't do it systematically, which is a problem. Um, in the paper, there's just a throwaway line saying that some of the patients were referred on to, and, and some of the patients were referred back to, to community therapists, and some of them did have capacity to take them on again and do a few more sessions, but we didn't systematically um, measure it. I, I would be a bit cautious about these maintenance uh, effects, but, but they have been seen in other domains, like I said, in the upper limb. If I wanted to give a positive spin on it, I would say that you when we talk about clinically meaningful change on these linear scales, um, it happens in upper limb. You, if you're very severely weak, you can make a really big improvement, but still your limb is functionally pretty useless, right? And that can happen with language too, I think. But there may be some sort of magic line there that's invisible and is there for everybody at a different level where you get above that level and then suddenly you're now using your language more in day-to-day -day activities. And we think uh, that that's the positive spin on it, why somebody might continue to improve even though the intervention itself has stopped. I think intervening, these were in the chronic phase. Some of them had got into bad patterns. This is anecdotal. Some of them had got into bad patterns with their partners, but the partners were doing all the work for them. It was less effort. You know, they were just talking less. They were just talking and interacting less. And part of the therapy was to get them to interact more. Um, so I don't know what level you would say that's at, the kind of psychosocial aspect or the, or, or the kind of systemic, but I think that was something that the therapist did quite a lot. And again, was something I wasn't really aware of, but I think in the chronic phase, some patients and their partners, perhaps because things seem to have flattened off completely, they go, okay, this is the status quo, right? I'm going to, when we go in the shop, I'm going to talk for you. And we try to push against that. Thank you so much, Alex, for so generously commenting and answering all those questions. We really do appreciate your time and your wonderful presentation today. Um, thank you so much again. Um, if I could, I'd like to just let everyone know about our next seminar, which will be next, early next month um, in July. We're really pleased and excited to have Professor Cathy Price present from the University College London on Wednesday, the 7th of July, uh, and she will talk to us about predicting and explaining speech and language outcome and recovery in adult stroke survivors. So thank you everyone for your participation today and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.